Can I do this? Yeah, OK. So that means I'm basically, I guess you guys are more or less out of luck. I've been trying to bring that one up, but nobody seems to be able to. OK, essentially, if you're on this side, I'm sorry, for some reason we can't get this one working at the same time as the other one. OK, essentially, what we have over here is the famous dog cartoon. Um, and essentially, the, question, the point is you have the dog sitting in front, of the la in front of the guy's computer terminal saying, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And that's essentially the whole issue of authentication. If you're doing automated authentication, you have this separation between people or other you know, knowledgeable mechanisms that can actually you know, do a stronger certification of identity and instead, you have some mechanism there. And if, in fact, Bowser has looked underneath the guy's mouse pad, found his AOL password, he can pretend to be the guy on AOL. Or maybe he just managed to find an AOL disk when he was you know, eating his dog food. I mean, they come in just about every package now. So uh, that's essentially the issue there. And we have our authentication factors, You know, the classic ones, something you know, password or PIN. Uh, something you are, a personal trait like a biometric, and then of course something you have, a key or a token. I have, everybody ha probably has a key or token that says black hat on it. It doesn't necessarily authenticate you as a particular individual, but it does say, yeah, I'm the guy who's supposed to be able to get into this room. That's of course a pretty simple one. And there are all kinds of other ones out on the market now. OK, let's start with the password tradition, of course. They're the essence of computer authentication. They verify ownership of a personal secret. And so what you see is um, um, you, know, you type the thing in, and it goes into the machine. And then inside the machine, you have this table that you're identifying against, which will have you know, your passwords. Now, the thing is, today, you really have to talk about passwords in a much broader context. They're, Sometimes there are personally chosen secret, like the things you use when you log into you know, a particular uh, application or site. But, and you know, a lot of times people actually do a decent job of choosing a personally chosen secret, which is it should be impossible to remember and never written down. So if you don't know how to choose passwords, keep that in mind. If you can remember it, it's a bad password. If you can't remember it, it's a strong password. Now, this is kind of hopeless, of course. So people either write down the hard ones or they memorize one hard one and use it for a lot of different things. It's the way life is. Now, in fact, we're authenticating ourselves on the internet with a lot of other stuff. Names, contractions of your names, phone numbers, extensions, social security numbers, mother's maiden name, credit card number, birth date, et cetera, et cetera. And so people are attacking today's passwords by going after all that sort of information. Um, first of all, we have, here are various attacks that have been going on. Of course, database theft, a lot of that. Um, and then there's phishing, which is a word that comes and goes. I actually saw it in the Wall Street Journal last week, so I guess it's sort of making a comeback, um, which is essentially the notion of presenting people with something that looks like a plausible login screen, and they provide authentication information, which the guy then pockets and runs off with. Sniffing is, of course, alive and well and in the news. And also, there's just the problem that a lot of organizations make it too easy to steal passwords. So let's look through some of these things that have been going on. OK, database intrusion and theft, in case anybody missed it. 59,000 records were stolen at the University of Texas. Back in March, um, they were social security numbers of current and former students of, and employees. In case nobody's gotten the message, social security number is one of those key bits of information you need if you are going to steal somebody's identity. This should not be a surprise. Then there's the 5 million Visa card accounts that were accessed. Um, that was in February. That was reported. Uh, 500,000 medical records of, medical, of military personnel were compromised when somebody stole the hard drives. This sort of gets back to the question of encryption. Um, if you have sensitive information, can you encrypt it? Or should you at least put in reasonable amount of physical security to keep it from being stolen? Then there's 
credit bureaus, um, the 30,000 entries stolen is, or accessed by inappropriate people is but one example. I'm trying to remember if that, that may or may not have been the case that recently occurred in which they uncovered in, New York, in the New York City area where essentially people were going into the credit bureaus, collecting information from them, and then using that for the identity theft, which is really the most efficient way to do it. If you're going to do identity theft, you should use you know, a credit bureau. It gives you all the information you need. Um, and then University of Oslo. Essentially, Oslo had actually gone to a lot of trouble to secure their network, make sure everything's nice and safe, all the patches are in place, and you know how hard that can be. Um, so everything was nice and tight. Well, they plugged in some Microsoft SQL software that was needed as part of some intermediate, some interim activity that was going on. And the attacker discovered that, yes, it was old not, or not sufficiently well patched. So they went through there. Once they, got, once they established themselves inside the SQL server, they had the keys to the city. So that's the old thing. OK, now password cracking with dictionaries. This has just come back in the news recently with, uh, uh, in case nobody had heard it, which I'll mention in a moment. But just to quickly review, essentially, the classic and simplest way to do password cracking is to create a big dictionary in which you take a whole bunch of words that are likely to be used as passwords, which is basically you know, any English word, um, and collections of names and things like that. Names in foreign languages, if those languages are likely to be used by people on the system and such. Uh, this has been known for years and years and years. Some wonderful studies have been done on it. Um, but anyway, once you have all of that, if you look at the diagram, essentially what's happened is on, um, on this side, we have the dictionary. And then we run it through our encrypting hash process to end up with a list of hashes. So essentially, if you have a list of passwords like you have at the bottom of the chart there, you can go through that list of passwords and then compare them against the hashes. If you get a match, then you just go back, index through the dictionary, and that word in the dictionary is the missing password. Well, state-of-the-art Windows NT password cracking uh, what, the state of the art was just recently improved by, um, uh, what was his name again? Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this. Oxlan um, at uh, EPFL in Switzerland. Uh, essentially, what he did was he looked at the time memory trade offs in doing cryptanalysis and discovered this really terrific way of building a dictionary that actually wasn't a dictionary of English words so much as it was a dictionary of encryptions. Um, and found there was this great way of building a dictionary that could crack 99.9% .9 of all password, alphanumerical passwords. And so, and, uh, so a group of uh, his colleagues there put together a cracker program. Now the results were that a successful crack on average took nine seconds. So that essentially means he pulled the password hash out of the SAM database, gave it to the Cracker program. Nine seconds later, it told you what the password was. Now, they put this on the um, internet and essentially said, send us your hashes. We'll tell you what the passwords are. And actually, he asked people, make them alphanumeric passwords, because we can crack all of those. Well, only about. 38% of the passwords that were sent were actually alphanumeric because those were the ones he was able to crack. Maybe a few more were um, because it's not a 100% perfect um, uh, technique. There's some percentage of passwords it just doesn't get. Um, failed cracks took, on average, about 174 seconds. Failures took longer because of the nature of the method. But the whole point is, um, if you're able to get that password file off of the system, there is this great technology for cracking them. Now, of course, the thing is, you do have to retrieve that hash first. And it's now getting to the point that if somebody has enough access, back in the good old days, basically, if you were on a Unix system, you could get the hashes. If, you know, and uh, people sort of thought, well, maybe we can you know, protect one part of Unix from another. Well, these days, most people acknowledge that if you can get far enough into the system to retrieve the password hashes, you're already pretty deep in trouble. So. 
I'm not sure whether this is a major issue or not, but it doesn't seem that seem like the highest priority problem in security right now is you know strong versus weak passwords. The real problem I see with weak passwords is when you use you know your nickname, your girlfriend's name, you know things where literally you can call up psychic friends and they'll say, oh well the password is because psychic friends is all that that approach to Cracking passwords is always you use information about the person to figure out what they'd use as a password. I, I've always seen that as being a real risk. Uh, okay. Of course, actually, if you get on the network, there's another whole set of issues. But um, anyway, phishing, website trickery, the typical scenario. Actually, I'm going to jump ahead for a minute just to show you one. Uh, PayPal. Okay, you get an email, and it says, visit this site to keep your account up to date. Put your, e put your email address here and your password for your uh, PayPal account, and we'll fix everything for you. Make sure that your PayPal system still works. Well, surprise, it stops working because all of a sudden your money's gone. Isn't that wonderful? OK, so essentially the typical scenario is um, you get an email that says, you need to do something to your account. You need to take some action. Here, go to this um, website and take care of it. And then you get there, and it collects a bunch of personal information that is then, you know, grabbed by the uh, perpetrator. Uh, Discover Card, um, well, a bunch of Discover Card people receive bogus account status messages. Your account is inactive. Visit the site to re reactivate it. Put in all this personal information, which is just what you need to do, you know, your theft. And that was that was this April that that was reported. Okay, Network Solutions had this rather interesting thing going around where people were sending things that looked like domain name updates, which is actually a rather clever way of doing it because you can simply go on the internet and collect all of that, um, all that contact information out of the DNS records and then generate these emails and say, well, you need to you know, do something to your account, give us all this information, and game over. And then Best Buy, somebody did you know, one of those slightly better approaches to, slightly nicer twists to the uh, social engineering aspect of this, where they said, this is a fraud alert. We're afraid there is a fraudulent thing on your account. Give us this information and we'll fix it. And then, of course, we have eBay. Um, there have been a few things going on where people have been trying to collect um, victims' eBay uh, information. Uh, Let's see, the, the picture there is ebayverification.net when it was there. And that's essentially trying to collect people's eBay IDs so they can then take it over and then probably do some fraudulent transactions and have them blamed on this other guy. Also, there is ebayupdates.com, which was actually collecting credit card information. Actually, one of the things I found really clever was somebody used a stolen credit card number to buy the domain name in order to set up one of those bogus sites. I mean, that is actually the smart way to do anything like this. I mean, if you're going to do something fraudulent, you might as well do it on somebody else's credit card so you're not the one who gets caught. OK, and then there's some slightly more advanced techniques. OnlineNick.com was, uh, those customers were treated to this notion, uh, to receiving this message that said, we're having trouble. People are attacking our website. And that's probably affecting your, the performance of your, uh, of your uh, internet connection. Although, in my case, and probably in a lot of other cases, my internet connection has absolutely nothing to do with my domain name setup. I mean, they're just totally different, um, different ser services entirely. But anyway, what you they said, what you need to do is collect, connect to this, to one of our proxy servers. Now, once you get somebody's connection through a proxy server, you can do whatever you want to their traffic. So it's a wonderful thing to do if you're into that sort of thing. Um, let's see, yeah, that was, that was another March report. Okay. In the United Kingdom, nobody identified the bank involved, but there was this bank in the UK, and essentially the, what the scammers did was they bought a domain name that looked like it belonged to this particular bank. It didn't, but it looked like it. And then they set up a variation of the Nigerian scam. Has anybody here not received Nigerian scam email? Cool. 
Okay, well, yeah, I've, I've actually gotten them from much of the African subcontinent. I haven't gotten one from Iraq yet. Um, but anyway, uh, so essentially the idea is you connect to this website that belongs to this legitimate sounding bank as part of the scam and then you get robbed. And then monster.com, a bogus employer's background check. Somebody on Monster put up a job opportunity and as part of the background check they collected all this personal information on the candidate and they used it for ID theft. Okay, here's one that I found really interesting. And you sort of have to step through this a bit. And first, remember that last year, a couple of guys were um, convicted of using the fact that one of them worked at one of those online racetrack betting companies and used that fact in order to win a race. Sort of like, um, you know, the sting. You know, catching the information before it actually got posted to the site. That sort of thing. And so you mix this with the notion of website phishing, and you get a, this really interesting email scam where the guy says, I used to do software for net game and casino. Well, they screwed me out of the money that they owed me. So he, I'm getting back at them. I put in this back door. You can get into the casino by following this URL. Then you'll make all this money off of them. And essentially, you know, collect the guy's credit card number in order to start the betting going. Game over. Um, actually, if you add in the Nigerian scam to that, I think it gets even more cleverer from a, say, social engineering thing. And actually, the first time I read that, I thought, well, maybe that's what they're doing. The guy can say, well, I've made all this money, and now if you give me you know, some accounts I can use, I can get all the money out, and you, know, you can be the one who looks like you want it. Ha, ha, ha. Now, getting on to another thing, this really annoys the heck out of me, which is that Internet marketing companies are sending messages on behalf of other companies using unfamiliar domains. For example, Fidelity Investment sends a lot of their email directing you to sites belonging to m0.net, which belongs to Digital Impact, not Fidelity Investments. Wells Fargo, I just got one the other day. Um, Mediaplex at z2c.net has been sending me email saying, if you need to update your PIN, Go to this website. Now, I've actually contacted the people involved, and it seems as though some of these are actually legitimate. I went through this lengthy round with some vice president at uh, Fidelity about, you know, is this a real site, and why are you doing this silly thing? Basically, nobody can tell whether it's legitimate or not. And the thing is, it's a bad idea because you're teaching the customers the domain names are irrelevant. It doesn't matter where we say we're from, you know, trust us. You know, just look at the text. If it says it's fidelity, trust us. Um, if, on the other hand, if emails and web links always carry the legitimate domain name of the sender, it makes it harder for the fishers. It makes it harder to build those phishing systems and make it work because, in t because educated people can identify that they're going to the wrong destination. Non-company domain names put customers at greater risk. And it was interesting going through this discussion with Fidelity because what kept coming back was, well, according to our privacy policy, blah, 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 blah. Well, that's nice, but it doesn't help me any. Okay, password sniffing, getting on to another subject. Um, okay, we all know that password sniffing has existed forever, perhaps. Um, trust me, it's, it's existed forever. But it's, even with, even though SSL usage has really knocked it out as far as activities on the internet, it's really had a great renaissance in the last few years with, um, with so software stuck onto people's machines. Uh, Phil Zimmerman mentioned Little Nicky Scarfo, which has happened, I don't know, probably about 2000 or so. Uh, but much more recently, there was that wonderful little thing at, at Kinko's in, uh, the New York area, I believe it was, um, back in July. Actually, it was, yeah, just, it's still July, isn't it? Yeah, so it was just this month they, uh, they reported on that. Uh, 14 Kinko stores, the guy got over 450 user IDs and passwords. All he did was take some very standard sniffing software, stuck it in these machines in these Kinko stores, and then he'd go around every so often harvesting the passwords that they collected. Same thing happened in Tokyo, and the people netted $141,000, well, it's 16 million yen, which 
also sounds wonderful, um, from victims' accounts because what they did was they collected keystrokes of these guys who were, you know, checking their, um, checking their bank stuff online. Birmingham, England, similar sort of thing. So yes, it really, it really works, it really happens. Um, something that annoys me is that there's a lot of stuff still on the internet where people are using passwords in plain text. Um, it was reported in risks in March that part of the pass Microsoft Passport registration was actually going in plain text. I'm not sure if that's been fixed yet. Um, First USA Bank won their website login was plain text. Equifax would send your username and password by email to you in plain text, of course. And of course, eBay, most stuff is in the clear, although they do have the option that if you want to encrypt your password when you log in, you can. Um, and then the whole cordless keyboard thing uh, was reported in, um, well, let's see, a newspaper in Nor Norway uh, said a couple of neighbors realized that they were typing on each other's computers because they were using wireless keyboards. And then there's the whole thing of obvious passwords. People are choosing obvious passwords a lot these days. Um, one of the broadband companies uh, changed all user passwords to RCN, RCN. I guess it was RCN was the old broadband company name. And so when Patriot Media came in, they were updating their systems and they just you know, replaced all the passwords. That's also a pet peeve of mine, is that it seems like when it's not as bad now, but it seemed like for a long time, whenever I was uh, trying to use some site belonging to somebody who was just getting started with e-commerce, it seemed like every six months you'd have to re-register because they'd improve their software somehow and lose all your credentials. And I guess that has some advantages in some sense, but it also suggests a um, sort of lack of engineering discipline. Oh, and then there's this other wonderful thing Okay, one of these other hot buttons with me is the notion that if you're going to have people logging in remotely, you've got to treat that as a different, completely different case than the case of having employees locally on site logging in. If you want to use your sister's girlfriend's name mixed in with your dog's name or something like that and type it in when you're inside your company you know, surrounded by your colleagues who can probably be more easily break into your computer physically than by trying to hack into it. Um, it almost doesn't matter what you choose as a password as long as it's something that at least slows them down as much as that lock on your desk does, which is not very much. On the other hand, if you're logging in remotely, you really need to use some serious protection because that's the case where, you know, if an outsider thinks, oh, well, I know he has a password, he has a username, um, the username's probably this, so oh, this is his girlfriend's name, put this sort of stuff together. That's worthy of attack. Or that's, so you want to have different passwords internally than externally, and this company did that. But then they outsourced their systems administration, and the new administration company came in and decided that, uh, well, they knew they had a separate password database to manage, and of course they updated everything. So they replaced all the passwords with something that was like, what did they say here? It was, um, um, oh, okay, I didn't actually say there, but my recollection was, it was something like the, the guy's initials, first initial, last initial, and then phone extension. So if you knew somebody's phone extension in the company, which meant you also probably knew their first and last name, you could log in as them from the outside. And the best part was you couldn't change those passwords. They were burned in stone. Okay, and then Sprint, all the configuration models for uh, the DSL modems they were putting out were one, two, three, four. That's kind of, I don't use DSL myself, so I'm not sure exactly whether that opens a serious vulnerability or not. Um, maybe it was just another one of those stupid things. And then New York Times last summer had a thing where they were um, reassigning website passwords to match some other information the user had provided them, like screen names, uh, which was also a bad idea. Tax ID is password, another nasty. Um, T-Mobile was setting up wireless hotspots where, yeah, you could log in, but you had to use your social security number as your password. Um, hopefully that was after some sort of encryption was established. 
PNC Bank, oh, I love this one. Princeton University's online accounts all use the university's tax ID as an identifier. So if you're managing the account that belongs to a student organization, you at the same time have access to all the university, other university accounts at that bank. Isn't that convenient? Okay, authentication tokens. <clears throat> I used to work for a company that built these things, so I figured that you know they were almost as good as they were almost the greatest thing since sliced bread. Um, of course, you know, not working for companies gives you a much better perspective on things. Um, actually, some of these things are kind of interesting. Um, the whole point is you want to build something that's hard to copy. <clears throat> so the attacker has to actually steal the thing in order to log in. Now, you can do the whole dance of requiring a PIN as well, and clearly you do that with, uh, with uh, ATM cards because, you know, if you're going to steal something, it's a great thing to steal. And uh, the other thing is you can't tell if somebody sniffed your password, but by golly, you can tell if they've stolen your token. Now, the problem, though, is tokens aren't as hard to copy as we might wish. Um, first of all, magnetic stripe things like this. Um, <clears throat> a lot of colleges are using these as charge things so that essentially you can charge your things around campus. <clears throat> oh, good luck. Oh, this, eh, no, no, no. That, 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 Sonny did something magical to this so that doesn't work. Yeah. It's probably something in the BIOS. This is actually my wife's laptop. <clears throat> and she gets really upset when I play with her BIOS, so. <laughs> Can't believe I said that, but okay. Okay, magnetic stripes, they are way too easy to copy. And the wonderful thing is, you can buy the equipment all over the place. Boston College, a student went around, copied all of his friends' mag stripes, started putting them on his stripe so that all of his stuff was charged to their cards. <clears throat> they caught them, and it hit, hit the news in February. USB tokens, um, Kingpin at, at stake did some really neat research on that. Um, uh, basically, USB tokens are these things. They're just you know, little thingamabobs that just plug right into the USB port. Generally, they're glorified smart cards. They have little crypto on them, um, some storage, and essentially we'll do a protocol in order to verify that they're actually present. And uh, so basically what Kingpin did was he popped a couple of these open and looked at how he could recover, say, master keys from them or other configuration data which could then be used to subvert them so that essentially you could copy one of these tokens without actually you know, having legitimately collected the information. Instead, you just get it by physically attacking the token. <clears throat> Smart cards are essentially, well, satellite television runs off of smart cards, and smart cards are, of course, the next big thing, or they have been for, what, about 15, 20 years in the States. Uh, they've been using them a lot in Europe. And there are some great stories there. But here in the States, the big story on attacking smart cards is in, in the world of satellites. I, I actually haven't done that much with this. If any of you have... Uh, gone through the satellite TV thing, I would love to talk to you. Um, actually, one of the things that happened was while I was studying the whole thing, what came, came down to it is at this point, if you really want to have consistent satellite TV, it seems like you're spending as much money trying to keep up with their countermeasures as you would have spent just doing satellite TV anyway. But I don't know, maybe that's not true. I would love to you know, talk to some people if they have some experiences. Um, so anyway, here's some things that um, have been used in the satellite TV world in order to um, subvert smart cards. Interception attacks, card rewriting, where you take a card and make some subtle changes to it. Reverse engineering, um, and then actually cloning cards. And in insider theft, where somebody actually collected information from one of the satellite security vendors and provided it to the um, cracking community. And here's some of the people playing in this saga. You've got satellite programming vendors, DSS, DirecTV, Dish, Sky, Canal Plus, blah, 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 blah. There's a company named NDS um, overseas that uh, builds satellite TV and smart card security solutions. 
They have an interesting website. Um, then there are a bunch of, I call them gray market vendors. Essentially, they build products that interact with smart cards in some strange and wonderful ways. And uh, in particular, these are sold to people in the satellite TV cracking community. So there's this whole issue of, well, is this stuff legal or not? And evidently, it's gone through several iterations. For a while, Canada was the great place to go to buy this stuff if you lived in the US, because it was not against Canadian law to crack US satellite signals. OK, countermeasures. I love these games of ping pong when you know you get the attack countermeasure stuff going. So you have all these hacker attacks going. Actually, I just mentioned just about all of these. And then you have industry defense, defenses. <clears throat> Anti-reverse engineering stuff has been going into smart cards for several years now. Um, internal secrets and encryption. Uh, you've always had a certain amount of internal secrecy inside those cards. You know, just pieces of information that are unique to the card that belong to this card but not another one, and that information is not accessible from the outside. Then there are command protocols that they can use in order to make sure that they're really talking to the card. And then there's electronic countermeasure messages that, <coughs> that, the, uh, satellite community, that the satellite companies will send to all their cards. And the, they try to design these messages so that they will crash the bogus cards or cloned cards or you know, cards that weren't actually paid for. And so the guys in the satellite companies actually spend a lot of time studying these techniques that are being used against them so they can develop their own countermeasures. <clears throat> OK, interception attacks. Um, essentially, these di yeah, okay. essentially, these are situations where you actually have a board that plugs into the uh, normal socket for the smart card. And uh, if you're on the side with the diagram, um, you can actually see a row of contacts at one end of that thing that kind of looks like a hatchet. And then at the other end, the, the regular um, satellite access card is plugged in. <clears throat> now, you can put all sorts of stuff on that board in order to deal with those signals as they go back and forth. So if the guy says, uh, yes, I want to get to this pay-per-view, and the card comes back and says, no, you're not allowed to, um, the circuitry in the middle, depending upon how badly it was designed, or, or the circuitry in the middle can interrupt that flow and say, oh, yeah, you can look at it, assuming they didn't do the right things on their protocols. And the thing is, in the good old days, things were easier than they are now. <coughs> also, <coughs> you've got one of these cards here, which just plugs into that, uh, into that um, outlet and essentially takes the smart card connection and plugs it into a serial port on your computer so that the computer can essentially emulate the smart card itself. <coughs> OK, card rewriting. This is a uh, or cloning, if you prefer. This is something that seems to be a lot more popular now. Essentially, people will plug in the card that they got, which allows them to do the programming, and into one of these special card reader programmer devices. <coughs> and the devices will play these various tricks with the cards in order to get as much information off of them as possible or to put them into strange states. They have these, this process called glitching, where they do things to the signals going into the cards in order to put them into bad states, which then provide a lot of information. Um, traditional, uh, originally there were the, what they called the Series H cards, which had onboard encryption, but didn't actually encrypt the commands that were going back and forth. So they could essentially do some protocol to try to make sure that they weren't being, you know, there wasn't a man in the middle attack, but not very much. Um, with the HU cards, they actually encrypt the commands so that the card has a prayer of being able to tell that the command's been intercepted. <clears throat> However, people have come up with ways of attacking those cards that don't even break the encryption. And uh, that's one of those really interesting things about encryption is if you don't do it exactly right, there are all these wonderful ways you can change things. Um, I don't know if people remember the stuff that was going on with point-to-point uh, -point transfer protocol, PPTP, uh, essentially one of the problems in there was you were using RC4, a serial um, encryption uh, algorithm, but you were always starting it at the same point so in, the, in the internal state so that it was using the same row of bits to encrypt different streams of data. 
actually, as stuff went in opposite directions, you were, start, you were using the same initial key state at both ends. So essentially, you could take the data going that direction, lay it against the data going the other direction, and all the crypto would fall out, and you would simply have the plain text running in both directions layered on top of each other. And that's way easier to crack, because there's no real crypto there. Now, I don't know if that's what they did here, but that's the sort of mistake that could be made. OK, reverse engineering. Integrated circuit reverse engineering technology is a big deal. Um, it's actually used a lot in legal proceedings where company X um, thinks that company Y has stolen their you know, proprietary technique for you know, something on a chip. And so what happens is they will hire a reverse engineering company to shave off the layers of one of those commercial ICs, figure out how the thing was built, and compare it against their patents or their trade secrets or whatever. Depends upon whether, you know, how, that, how that all went. This is considered a legitimate business, but it basically means there's a lot of technology out there commercially available that can help you take apart integrated circuits or smart card, the, these embedded smart card chips. Same technology is used to attack those. Okay, NDS, uh, satellite smart card security company I mentioned earlier, has recently been sued by Canal Plus, who accused it of reverse engineering its smart card and then putting the technology out on the internet so that people could then hack their system. Um, DSS joined the suit later this year. The DSS part of the suit is an important, an important point, which I'll bring up now as we talk about insider attacks. Okay, P4, Access Card 4, is the latest technology used in DSS. Well, it turns out the technical details for this card were captured and distributed to the satellite cracking community last year. And it turns out the way that happened was the law firm that had been hired to help DSS set up their suit against NDS, one of the guys who was hired there as a temp to make photocopies made an extra set of photocopies. No, actually, they were digitizing everything. He made CD-ROMs, much more efficient. Nicer for the environment, too. OK, now I'll move on to biometrics. Um, I really razzed on these last year. Um, it's just your generic picture of a biometric thumbprint reader. That's my daughter's finger. Um, OK, cracking modern biometrics. Uh, I'm not being real comprehensive here. I'm just going to talk about two problems. One is the cloning problem where essentially you take somebody's biometric feature and you clone it. Um, the other one is the screening problem, which is what, what happens when we try to use these biometrics techniques in airports to identify terrorists, since of course that will make us all safe, right? Okay, face cloning. Actually, I think I showed this one last year too. Uh, some folks in Germany uh, did this wonderful set of um, experiments showing that, yes, by golly, you can put somebody's face, actually put a video of their face on a laptop computer screen, hold it up in front of the video cam camera that's doing the authentication, and it thinks there's a person there, which is really nice. Um, the best part is they also claim that if you, take, you can take the video surreptitiously so that essentially it's an involuntary cloning. So it's kind of like you know, on Charlie's Angels where you know, they're grabbing the guy's beer bottle and stuff like that. Now. Yes, I think it, okay, yeah, the black hat curse is hit again. I really have to, I really have to use different software next year, because the same thing happened last year. It got partway through the presentation and it stopped forwarding. So what I have to do is, but fortunately, I think we're getting towards the end, so I am actually going to stop this stupid program, start it over, and then zoom back to where we were. This will only take a minute, so if you want to sort your notes for a minute, that's fine. And I was just going to do the good part, too. Actually, wait a minute, I'm going to try this. Are we back? Nope. 
Oh, I forgot to tell it everything I needed to tell it. I needed to also have setup show monitor two. Okay, we're back. Okay, face cloning. Yeah, did that one. Did that one. Fingerprint cloning. Okay, several several things have been done over the last few years. Um, Willis and Lee did some stuff in 1998 that was published in one of the magazines. Um, Fallheim. Yeah, those were the folks in Germany. Um, tried both capacitive and optical sensors, found some wonderful things they could do with capacitive sensors. Like, for instance, take a bag, a plastic bag of warm water, hold it against the sensor, and actually cause it to detect the presence of the previous fingerprint that was used to authenticate on that device. I thought that was very clever. Um, okay, and then Matsumoto went through and tested 11 sensors against his technique for cloning fingers. And here's Here's his technique. Essentially, you buy some modeling plastic, and then you get some um, gummy, bear, gummy bear style gelatin from the grocery store, and you build yourself a little thin gummy finger that you can actually put over your fingertip. And uh, if nobody's looking too closely, you can authenticate with it, even in the presence of witnesses. That was rather nice. OK, now this is one that I had heard rumors that somebody had actually pulled this off. And what it is is iris cloning. OK, you remember there's iris authentication techniques, too, which look at that really pretty part of your eye um, and look at they're those they're really fine lines making a pattern around that around you know the pupil and essentially authenticating people on that. So you have this camera that looks at your eye. It's a standoff sort of device, too. So it's not as creepy as the retinal scanners, where you actually have to put your eye on something. And evidently, that really creeps a lot of people out, which is one reason you don't see a lot of, of, a lot of retinal scanners on it, just because user acceptance is pretty low. Um, also, I talked to a woman who uh, it stopped recognizing her when she got pregnant, because that changes the blood flow, which changes the way that the retinal blood vessels appear. So there's that, too. But anyway, so essentially what you do here is you photograph the guy's eye. And it, if, if you look closely at this picture, the guy's actually sort of doing that in the picture. So it probably requires some participation from the victim. And then you actually poke a hole in the middle of the iris so that the pupil is actually visible behind it. And it works. OK. To wind up here, let's see, am I, about, I have about 15 minutes. Yeah, OK. Well, I'm probably going to wind up in the next five minutes, and then I can answer questions if there are any. But anyway, just to wind up, this is one of these things that has just really driven me nuts watching this the last, ever since 9-11, where people say, well, we're going to save the world by putting video cameras in the airports and matching them against the faces of known terrorists. OK, so it's a simple question of arithmetic. If you haven't gone through the math, I'll give you the math here. How effective is facial recognition? That's the first question. The second one is, how big is the watch list? And given those, is there a prayer of success for this? OK, let's start with face recognition te testing. National Institute of Standards and Technology, in conjunction with the Department of Defense, had a team that did some tests of what they considered the most promising, mature uh, face recognition technology on the market today. It was an offline test, which essentially says they already had collected the uh, actual um, face data. And so what they were doing was they were going to run this against their algorithms in order to see if their algorithms could do the recognition. And they just stipulated that, yeah, there are ways you can aim a camera at somebody and get their face in there. Um, once we've stipulated that, how good are the recognition algorithms? There are 120, over 121,000 images of over 37,000 people. And uh, essentially, they recognized the right people 90% of the time. And that was with a false acceptance rate of 1%. Essentially, they tried to keep that false acceptance rate constant, the notion being that False acceptance is it looks at somebody and says, 
oh yeah, that is Joe, when it's not Joe. So they didn't want to have a high acceptance rate. They wanted that as low as possible, and they decided 1% was a good place. Um, I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so in sort of ideal circumstances, they could get a 90% success rate uh, for actually recognizing somebody. Um, now, as the database size increases, though, the recognition rate goes down. So a uh, database of 800, they were getting 85%, not 90%. Uh, 37,000, they were getting 73% recognition rate. So how does this map into things? Okay, well, what's the watch list size? There are 13 million terrorists out there. Doesn't that make you sleep well at night? Names only, not faces. And also, you've got the US government no-fly lists. I guess there are two of them, uh, at least that's the rumor. Uh, something in Salon recently was pointing out that it appears that one of the lists is actually a little bit more of a Nixonian enemies list, in that nobody knows what the criteria are to get on it, but little old ladies who go to protest marches seem to get on it for some reason. Uh, they're real threats, I'll tell you. And of course, there's the David Nelson problem. For some reason, if your name is David Nelson, you're on the list and you get pulled out. And I don't know how many of you know of Ozzie and Harriet, but they had a son named David Nelson, who is, I don't know, some, some minor muckety-muck in Hollywood still, and he gets pulled out. So anyway, um, there, keep in mind now, in the context of 640 million people visiting airports every year. Okay, so if we have a database of 1,600 no-fly faces. That means we will miss a no-fly person one out of six visits. So if you send 36 terrorists to the airport, six of them get through. If you have 35,000 no-fly faces, then that means if you send 16, four will get through. And if you have that 1% false positive rate, that means that of the 640 million people, 6.4 million people every year will be incorrectly detained at a U.S. airport. Doesn't that make you feel good? Okay, so that's about it then. Um, let me summarize. Really, it's not all as hopeless as it sounds. Um, but the thing is, you have to limit, recognize the limitations of full automation. Um, critical systems always have multiple layers and multiple checks. If you're really paranoid, think about how they design, say, nuclear weapons release. Um, that's probably about the highest assurance um, authentication process on the planet at this point. Um, and also, there are just a lot of other examples, two signature bank checks, you know, just things to add layers of assurance to the process. Um, personally, I've always believed that the way you really achieve security is by building it into your applications and not layering it on, because the applications know when things are going wrong. Uh, the really good fraud things tend to be things that look at buyer patterns, buyer behavior patterns. Um, yeah, it's nice to be able to make sure that it's the right guy using the credit card, but that's only part of it. Essentially, trust but verify. So that's all I actually have to talk about. Uh, so hopefully there are one or two questions. Yes? Could you speak louder? The best one, you, like of factors and stuff like that? <laughs> uh, people hate all authentication techniques. People hate passwords. People really hate tokens. Um, I think, personally, I've always sort of favored the notion of plug-in tokens like smart cards and you know, that sort of thing. Um, the handheld tokens where you have to transcribe stuff. Um, the real problem with tokens, one of the hugest problems with tokens right now is that they're based on public key technology. And this gets to what Phil Zimmerman was saying about how you don't have a public key infrastructure out there. People don't understand it. And so, and there's this high step function to get it all going. So people can't use smart cards because they're all based on the assumption that there's this public key infrastructure out there. A few organizations have deployed that sort of stuff because they just really wanted to. But for the most part, you know, it's just too big, too big of a step function. Is that about right? Okay. 
I mean, I think the most accepted pa authentication technique is passwords, and it's just because we're all used to it. Um, it's a terrible technique. Anything else? Golly. Well, thank you all then.